one I missed. Yes, sir. Do it on the crankshaft. Yeah. So let's talk about that just a minute. That was uh, that was a. Um, and actually, that will not change the stroke length. But that is that was the number one answer on the quiz. So um, you weren't the only guy thinking that. But it, let's uh, let's look at that a little bit. So this is our piston. And I guess while I'm on the piston, one other thing that I didn't really thoroughly go over, so I want to talk about it just a second while we're going by it. Um, on, the, on the top of the piston, most modern pistons will have three rings. There are some older pistons and some specialty ones that will have four, and there will be some specialty ones with less, but most will have three rings. And these top two are designed to hold the compression when we're compressing and our combustion with our, with our uh, downward pressure. And this third one is called an oil control ring. And it's constructed much differently. And its job is to try and spread the oil evenly around the cylinder to keep it lubricated. Um, and so it's called an oil control ring. And here's some rings you guys can look at. So these two are compression rings that are made to hold the pressure. This is one of those oil control rings that spreads the oil to kind of keep it even on the cylinder so it's all lubricated. Um, but I got sidetracked a little bit. So um, then we've got our wrist pin right here and our connecting rod. You got to bear with me on the on the art. I'm I'm not an art major here, but hopefully you can get the point. So if we change the length of this connecting rod, um, we have changed the geometry of the swing. But what actually makes that stroke? isn't a connecting rod. Now there's a lot of engineering that goes into this length and the length of that connecting rod affects how many degrees of rock it does but um, doesn't affect the stroke length actually. Because if you look at, at the, we'll look at the crankshaft by itself. So this is our rod bearing journal and if this is our main bearing journal so right here in the center of this is our center of rotation of the entire shaft. And this center is the center of rotation of this end of the rod. The distance between this center and this center times two, because we're moving that rod from this point around here to that same distance down, that's our stroke length. Um, and so if you want to change the length of the stroke, you change the camshaft, or excuse me, the crankshaft. Because that's what, same as in our bicycle, you know, our pedal from all the way up to all the way down, that's the, the throw in the crankshaft. And if we want to change how, how much leg action we're taking, well, you change the length of that arm on the crankshaft, which is distance from here to here. The other misconception that um, we've heard talked about is that you change the, the stroke if you grind the crankshaft. Like the crankshaft we were looking at last week, we had taken 10 thousandths off of the whole surface of this. So it was minus 0.010. And this surface, but all the way around the surface, was minus 0.010. We didn't change the centers. The distance from center to center is still the same. So the stroke length is still the same. Does that make sense? That the distance from here, and then when that crankshaft rotates around to here, that's where we get our stroke length. Now, if you can um, kind of use your imagination a little bit, you can, you can see that, okay, if compared to this, well, I'll go ahead and leave that one up there. 
compared to it, if we had a connecting rod that was this long, um, and our stroke length was, let's say, two inches. So it's from the center of our rotation here, we're up two inches, to down two inches. Well, we're also coming, as we come around, we're out here two inches, right? And we're over here two inches. Well, on a short connecting rod, to go over and back two inches, is, this is going to swing a lot more um, radically. So we might come over here 20 degrees to the left with this connecting rod and 20 degrees over here. So when it's swung over connected at this point, it's pushing sideways against this skirt quite a bit. And likewise, when it's connected over here, pushing this way, we've got a lot of pressure against this skirt. When you lengthen the connecting rod, I mean, this connecting rod, it may only be swinging five degrees left and five degrees right because it's not doing very many degrees of movement here to get over here two inches and over here two inches. So that makes a lot more straight down pressure and a lot less side pressure on the on the uh, thrust sides of the piston skirt so in the engineering of a lot of engines the distance between the cylinder and the center of the crankshaft they do a lot of engineering saying okay based on the pressure we're putting here and the distance here how long of a rod do we need so that we don't um, have so much pressure here that we exceed what our oil film can lubricate? Because um, if you're, there's a piston or two over here. Now this one, this scarring on this thrust was because the engine was run with an injector that was stuck open and that fuel washed all the lubrication off the cylinder wall. So this was a lack of lube. But this surface here is known as the thrust side. And the side that, um, you know, if the, if the, if the um, crank swings this way when we're in our power stroke, because our power stroke's where we have the most pressure on top of our piston. Um, so if the if the direction of rotation is such that the, the crank swings this way during our power stroke, this is known as our primary thrust side because it's the side that's going to have the most pressure on it. And you'll find that in most engines there will be some means of circulating a little more lube to this side than this side. The, the lubrication circulation will focus on the primary thrust side. Because um, there again, then the on the opposite side going this way is going to be in your compression stroke. So during the compression stroke, you'll have pressure here. Um, but for example, in this particular engine, I can tell you there's 400 psi of pressure on top of this piston on the average when you're in the compression stroke. When you're in the power stroke, it's about five times that much. So there's going to be a lot more pressure on this thrust surface during the power stroke than there is this side during the compression stroke. And of course, the other two strokes, it's pulling down. And when it's pulling down, there's not a ton of pressure here. Um, so typically, in, in factory engines, the length of this connecting rod is engineered around the pressure on the thrust sides of the piston. Um, when guys go to modifying these engines, why sometimes they're, you know, in race applications, what they'll actually do um, is run a longer connecting rod and run a custom piston that has the wrist pin higher up so they can reduce that angle and reduce that side pressure. Um, and of course, there's cases where guys want to use different cranks and blocks that weren't designed for them. You know, one that was popular when I was a kid was to take a 350 block and a 400 crank, 
and made them together and make a 383. Well, that was cool, but um, in order to do that, we were running a, a crankshaft that this throw was longer than stock, so they would run a shorter than stock connecting rod, because otherwise you'd shove the piston out the top of the cylinder. So when you're modifying engines, that kind of stuff can get pretty complicated, but um, it can be done, and you can make some fun stuff. But if you want to keep things uncomplicated, put back the parts that were factory, and that keeps it kind of uncomplicated. So does that clarify where the, the stroke length comes from? Everybody clear on that? Any other questions about uh, stuff we covered last week before we move forward? Um, I guess another question that there were several um, folks that maybe didn't quite follow is um, the question too about what's circulated around each cylinder. And maybe I wasn't clear, but I was talking around about on the outside of the cylinder. On the outside of the cylinder is where our water jacket is. That's what we use to cool the engine with. Um, on the inside of the cylinder, we will have lubrication in there. And I guess I didn't um, necessarily say inside or out, but that question does mention the cylinder block. And... That's what I was talking about, was the coolant that's inside the block on the outside of the cylinder walls. Um, okay, so... Um, this week, we had planned to talk a lot about um, cylinder heads and specifically um, valve train. So, we'll touch real quick on um, 70 years ago or so. It was probably the last time there was any automotive engine built that was a flathead. Um, but what flathead talks about, now this lawnmower engine is a flathead because the head is more or less just flat. Um, there's no moving parts in it. It's just a plate that slaps on there, bolts on, and seals the top of the cylinder. Um, you know, back in the 40s and 50s, um, and of course before that too, there were a lot of flathead engines. Um, and the reason... Uh, for building flathead engines is, well, there's less moving parts, and so they're a little cheaper to build. Um, the flow characteristics of them and the power characteristics of them are not as good as if we have... Uh, this is a pretty common for today automotive cylinder head. So we've got our valves in the head, and we've got a domed combustion chamber. And our pistons are typically more or less flat. They may have a little bit of dome that goes up into there. But anyways, our valves are in the head. Um, so this is the head for that Toyota engine we were um, tinkering with last week. And uh, this, is a, this is the other half of the cylinder head I cut in half for that model that's on the stand. And you can see this one has four valves per cylinder. There's two exhausts and two intakes, but it's also got valves in the head. Um, so back to this flathead, where are the valves? They're in the block. So you notice on this one, the valves are quite a bit different size. In this one, the valves are quite a bit different size. In this one, they're all about the same size. Any thoughts on why that might be? I'll give you a hint. In this engine, the big one is the intake valve. 
and the little one is the exhaust valve. So on the intake, we're, we're sucking, we're opening it as the piston goes down to suck air into this cylinder. But the exhaust valve, when it's going to open, um, we've already had our power stroke and we've got a lot of pressure in the cylinder. So there's pressure in here blowing out. So when we've got a lot of pressure in the cylinder, it doesn't take as big of a valve to move that volume of air when it's pressurized. But when we're, we're trying to take atmospheric air and suck it in, well, we need a little bigger area to get that volume of air in. Okay, This engine, same deal. Our big valve is our intake valve. That's where our intake air is going into our engine. The exhaust valve is the small one because we've got pressure to blow it out. On this engine, they're all the same size because we're force-feeding the engine. This heads off of a turbocharged engine, so we're shoving the air in it so we don't have to have quite as big a valve to get it in there because instead of sucking it in, we're putting 15 or 25, somewhere 15 to 25 PSI of pressure shoving it in. So we don't have to have quite as big of an intake valve when we're force feeding the engine. Um, so as far as valve arrangements go, like I said, in, in automotive engines, this flathead deal kind of, you know, boy, in the 50s was about the last time we saw any of this because it's just, it's just not great on, on uh, performance and efficiency. Um, but it was a simple and uncomplicated and fairly economic design to build. Because as you can probably see, here's our camshaft, and here's our lifters, and the lifters just push directly on the valve. So there's very few parts in the valve train, and none of them have to go up into the head, and so it's pretty inexpensive to manufacture. So Joe wants you to see this. So this is our camshaft, and you can see it's the cams there are pushing right straight on these lifters and these lifters are pushing right straight on these valves. So between the camshaft and the lifter, there's, excuse me, between the camshaft and the valve, there's one part, the, li the lifter that's in between there. And there's not, what's that? Yep, and you're right, it is. Now this this plastic gear in this engine is part of the governor system, which the governor system, it throws this weight as it goes faster and moves this lever, which helps control the engine speed. But there again, um, where there's not a lot of strain on that, well, the plastic gear is cheaper to make, so they can use a less expensive part, I think is part of the idea. But the gears that are on the crankshaft and the camshaft are huh, that cam gear is part plastic too isn't it yeah. yeah um so like i said that flathead system haven't seen in quite a while um now the i guess the sorry guys i didn't build that stand where it would come through that door so if everybody had just come out in the hall a minute, can we look at that engine a minute? And this is, of course, an overhead valve engine because the valves are in the head. <coughs> but this is what's known as a push rod engine. Um, so, so the valves are in the head, but the camshaft is still in the block. So this is the camshaft, and it's run off of this gear. Um, and if you guys want to look here, so the camshaft is basically a shaft that has a round journal that, that uh, a lifter's running on, but there's a bump on one side. And when we rotate that bump past the lifter, it pushes it up. So watch that right there, if you would. So you can see this cam lobe coming around. 
and this is our lifter. And when that cam lobe comes up against that lifter, it pushes up on that lifter. That lifter pushes up on this push rod. The push rod pushes on this rocker arm. And the rocker arm is pivoting on this center shaft. So when the push rod pushes up on this side of the rocker arm, this side of the rocker arm pushes down. Because this is a four valve per cylinder engine, there's a, what's known as a valve bridge here, and it's pushing these two exhaust valves open. So um, a couple other things we might talk about while we're out here. There's a lot of strategy involved in exactly how those cam lobes are designed because for different engines that are designed to run at different speeds and with different, whether it's forced induction, which this is a turbocharged engine, so we're forcing the air in it, or whether it's naturally aspirated where it has to suck its own air in, there's a lot of different design characteristics to the profile of these cam lobes. And when they're designed to open the valve. Um, and we'll look at that just a little more. But um, so right there, we've got the exhaust valves open. So this piston is coming up on its exhaust stroke. Now when it gets, yeah, thank you. When it gets to the top of its stroke, did you see that right as this exhaust valve was closing, this intake started to open? So that is, most engines are going to have that. That's what's called valve overlap. So if you can rock your engine back and forth and find right there that happy spot where both of them are barely open, you know this piston's at top dead center. It's at top dead center between its exhaust and intake stroke. Um, and if you choose to, you can mark that spot on your one, in, one of your wheels on one end of the engine, and if you go 180, excuse me, if you go 360 degrees, one full revolution of the crankshaft, this will be at top dead center again between your compression and power strokes. Um, so there's times when you're trying to figure out things that seeing that valve overlap can be really useful. But anyways, so we're right there at the point of valve overlap. So our exhaust valve is just closing. And just before it gets totally shut, the intake is opening. And you can see here our intake lobe on our camshaft, pushing up on our lifter, pushing on our push rod, pushing on our rocker arm, pushing on the valve bridge, and pushing those two intake valves open. So this, being able to flow this air in through these two valves, and they design it where it kind of swirls in the chamber, and then having a little bit of a swirling action as the exhaust comes out, they get really good flow through this, and you can really control it well, but you can see there's a lot of moving parts. So we've got our lifter, our push rod, our rocker arm, and then, of course, because of the multiple valves, we've got this bridge. So there's a lot of moving parts there. What's that, Joe? Uh, yeah. Right. So, um, the, on this 24 valve, the reason they did it is they couldn't pass the emission standard with the 12 valve. They had too much NOx, the oxides of nitrogen. And by designing the flow through these two valves and getting just the right swirl with the incoming air, they were able to reduce the oxides of nitrogen. There's a common misconception that that was done for performance. Not so. The, this same engine with two valves um, you look at a flow bench and all the guys that are building extreme hot rods with this 5.9 Cummins, they're actually building it with the two valve um, because it's easier for them to tune and get, get it to do what they want to. There's less, less complicated on that side, but they were able to reduce the oxides of nitrogen emission 
by getting just the right swirl in that chamber. Um, and they were also able to reduce the severity of the initial combustion a little bit, which reduced the noise just a little bit. Um, but the same, the same sudden pressure and temperature spike that made the noise was also making the oxides of nitrogen. So the two kind of go hand in hand. A couple other things to notice. Um, somebody watch that piston and tell me when it's at top. Which we got an intake valve open. Now? Right in there. So, in this engine, there's a, is there a lot of space between that valve and that piston? Everybody take turns and get a look there. Okay. Now watch how much that valve opens when we go around far enough to get... So compared to how much that valve opens, is there room for that valve to be open when the piston comes up? No. So um, timing is a critical thing. We need our valves to open and close at the right time. Now, when you hear people talk about timing on engines, um, a lot of those conversations are a little bit vague because there's two very important timing issues, and there's several others involved in an engine, but valve timing and ignition timing. So sometimes when guys are yammering about timing, they're talking about when the spark plug sparks or when the injector fires. And sometimes when we're talking about timing, we're talking about the timing of when the valves open and close. So um, there'll be less confusion in those conversations if you clarify which thing you're talking about the timing of. So typically, I try and say valve timing, injection timing, or spark timing, so we're, we're not uh, creating confusion. There's there's plenty of confusion already without me making more, right? Um, so this would be what's considered an interference engine. Um, and what that term talks about is if the valve timing gets out of whack and the valve is open when the piston comes up, will the two collide and tear each other up? Um, and sorry we're having computer troubles. I actually had pictures of an engine... Conan had tore down that um, one of the valves, it, we're guessing, because there was so much destruction, we don't know for sure, but we're guessing one of the valves had broken in the middle of this stem right here, and the bottom half of it had fell in the cylinder, and as the piston came up, it had jammed it into the head, and it had broke the piston and broke the head, and it had actually got wedged in there sideways and busted a hole in the cylinder wall, so... That was a $12,000 repair. Um, now, the other thing that can cause that is if these keepers here on the top of the valve are out of position or if they fail. Um, rarely do those fail if they're seated all the way correctly when they're assembled. And we can look at those in here in a minute. But there are, there are some engines, and I don't know of any diesel engines, there again, because the compression ratio on a diesel is so high, we're going 18 to 1, 17 to 1. We're trying to take this much air and space, squeeze it into a little bitty space. But on gasoline engines where we're going 8 to 1, um, in some cases that combustion chamber is big enough that they are not interference engines. Um, so want to kind of finish talking about the different valve systems, but then we were going to talk about the different camshaft drive systems. Yeah. 350 or 307. Uh-huh. And those uh, camshaft here is fiber. Uh-huh. A lot of those were... And that baby split. Mm -hmm. More talk about dent. Bent valves and push rods and made a made a big mess, huh? Oh, yeah. 
So what Rich is talking about is kind of along the lines of what I want to talk about a little bit next anyways. As far as driving this camshaft and timing it to our crankshaft, there's three common systems that's done with. And this one is gear to gear. You can see it's a steel gear to a steel gear. Now you notice this one's a lot smaller than this one. Why do you think that might be? I'll give you a hint. This one has exactly twice as many teeth on it as this one does. Right. We want our camshaft to turn one re revolution because for every two revolutions we turn our crankshaft. So if you think back to our four strokes, our intake, compression, power, and exhaust, of those of those strokes, how many of those strokes did we want this intake valve open? One. We want this intake valve open on the intake stroke only. So for those four strokes, we got to make two crankshaft revolutions, but we want the intake valve open once. So our camshaft has to turn half as fast as our crankshaft. So we're going to have twice as many teeth on this cam gear as on the crank gear. Does that make sense? Hey, Chase. How you doing? Chase just came from football practice, so. Um, any other questions on what you're seeing here before we go back and look at some of the others? Actually, it's not. Um, this is actually where you put an Allen wrench and turn this nut, and it's the adjustment, which is a good point, Wayne. Um, because there's so, so much length and so many moving parts, as well as we're going across this gap between the head and the block, and there's variableness there, um, there needs to be some adjustment in this system. This particular engine is designed so that when we roll the camshaft around and this lifter is all the way on the base circle, we want 20 thousandths of clearance here and 10 thousandths of clearance on our intake. And that adjustment is done here by turning this. Now, while we're on that subject, why do you think we want clearance in those and why are they different? Exactly. As this engine heats up and this long push rod heats up and the stem of this valve heats up, things are going to expand and we need to leave some clearance to make room for that. If we put it together with zero lash, as things heated up, this valve couldn't go all the way shut. And if a valve doesn't go all the way shut and seal, well, obviously our engine isn't going to run like we want because we're not sealing the combustion chamber. That's exactly right. Because the way the valve transfers heat out of the metal of the valve is through that face into the seat. And if those two aren't coming together closed, that heat transfer can't happen. So the valve overheats and it burns the edges off the valve. So 99% of the time, if you see a valve that has the edge of it burned off, that valve wasn't closing correctly. Um, some of them did, and some of them were designed where if you needed to adjust that, you pulled the valve out and you ground some off the tip. That's the way a lot of, for example, Briggs and Stratton's and Tecumseh's are currently built. Um, at the same time, like some of the Jeep and um, Flathead Ford V8 and some of those, they actually had a, a way to make some adjustment there. Some of those Jeep engines had a way to make adjustment on the intake valve, but if you wanted to adjust the lash on the exhaust, you still had to grind it. Yeah, pretty similar to this. See, this is actually a, a yeah. cover, and it was real similar to that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Somebody said... Um, 
and every engine has its own recommendations from the manufacturer. This particular engine, that's exactly the interval. Um, it Cummins recommended on on this. This was what was known as the VP series of the 5.9, which ran 98 and a half to 02, and on it, Cummins recommended adjusting these ever 100,000 miles. On the on the version just prior to that, the ones that were manufactured up through 97, they recommended doing it every 50,000 miles. On the ones made 2003 and newer, they didn't actually have a valve adjustment because the injectors failed often enough <laughs> that they said, whenever you're in there putting an injector in it, adjust the valves. Um, 03 was one of those years that they went to a completely and radically new injection system to pass emission standards, and that injection system is very unforgiving about water in the fuel. And actually, water flowing through those injectors didn't damage them so much as water setting in them when the engine wasn't running. There were some incredibly small tolerances in those parts, and a little dab of a rust pit that was two thousandths of an inch deep would make the injector completely useless. And so there was, it was pretty common that you'd need some injectors about every 100 to 120,000 miles. So I think that was part of their logic. They just said, you're in there doing injectors, adjust the valves while you're there. Because in this engine, and, and the, that 03 engine was very similar to this, the injector sits right there. And so to, to change that injector, you actually have to have this exhaust rocker off. Well, you take it off, you change the injector, then you put this back on, you're right there, do the adjustments. Now those need to be adjusted when the lifter is on the base circle. Um, if you can imagine, well, let's roll it around where we can see. Mm, going the wrong way. If, if this lobe is pushing on that lifter, well, it's, got, it's where the valve should be partway open. So that's not where we want to make our adjustment. But those lobes are pointed different ways because we need different valves open on different cylinders all the time. So um, there's actually a, a sequence where in the service manual, you roll the engine over to this spot and adjust certain valves because those will be on the base circle. Then it tells you rotate the engine to a new spot and adjust certain valves because those will be on the base circle. Because unless you knock a hole in the side of the block like I did for this demonstrator, um, using their plan is a lot easier than trying to guess which one of these is on the base circle. Any other Thoughts or questions here before we go back in? Okay. That's okay. No, no stupid. Uh huh. Um, and I'm not sure that the V8 versus the six is really where that comparison comes in as much as the camshafts they used in those. Because there again, the design of the camshaft profile, um, where the exhaust valve and intake are in relation to each other, as well as how high they open that, and that all combined with how the intake and exhaust runners are designed, the, the RPMs at which they work well can be radically different. Um, so camshaft design plays way more into that than really how the cylinders were arranged. But at the same time, the vintage when they were making the inline six gas engines, they were typically designing them to run at lower RPMs, and they were designing the camshafts with profiles that match those RPMs. You know, late 60s, early 70s when the V8s came in, they were wanting to run them at higher RPMs, and they, they designed the lobes on the camshafts differently to run different RPMs. Um, 
No, I agree. Stroke length does play into that. Um, and the longer the stroke, the more... There's two quantities that are talked about a lot as far as how much power an engine creates, horsepower and torque. And I've heard it described this way, and I think it's a good description, that horsepower wins NASCAR races and torque moves heavy loads. Um, and so if you want a high RPM, um, high horsepower engine, typically you're going to run short stroke and high RPMs. If you want to make a lot of torque to move heavy loads, you're typically going to run a long stroke compared to the size of the bore. Um, and the, the stroke length definitely is, you're exactly right, a good part of that. And the longer stroke engines, you can't run them as high RPMs because it takes longer to move all those parts all that distance. But the characteristics of how they flow um, really tends to make a lot more torque. But um, the stuff that's going to accelerate quickly, you know, talking about 0 to 60 acceleration times and stuff, um, you keep the short length stroke, you keep the short stroke length and run them higher RPMs and they'll accelerate faster, but not with a heavy load. So there again, you look at, okay, semi-truck engines. Semi-trucks are built to move 80,000 pounds. Um, one of the ones that I can think of right offhand, it has a five inch bore and an eight inch stroke. So the stroke is really long compared to the bore size. On the other end, one of the popular engines in NASCAR is a 327 Chevy. It's got a four inch diameter bore and it's got a three and a quarter inch stroke. So the stroke is short compared to the bore size. Mm -hmm. Right. And there again, a lot of the V8s are, they're designed to run more RPMs and more horsepower, but not as much torque and they tend to be a shorter stroke length. Well, let's go look at a couple other things in here. So, um, one of the main things we wanted to go over tonight, or one of the first things I should say, was the different valve arrangements. So we talked about the flathead, we talked about the overhead valve that's a push rod engine. And then this engine is an overhead valve, obviously, because the valves are in the head. But it has no push rods. Um, hmm. Paul, do you know where that little impact and rack of orange sockets wound up? Okay. Let's see if we can find them real quick, please, buddy. They may be in the pickup if they're not in one of these boxes. And they're not. Can you run out the pickup? See if you can find that little electric impact and that orange block of sockets. Um, I wanted to lay these pieces together so you can see kind of how they work together. But you can see this is a two-valve per cylinder engine. There's a large intake and a small exhaust because this is a naturally aspirated engine. We're sucking the air in, not forcing it in. And this is our camshaft. Um, so you can see the, the journals that are perfectly round are the ones where this shaft is supported in the engine. And the ones with cam lobes are actuating valves. But this camshaft is mounted in the head and there's no push rods. So this is a design known as an overhead cam design. Um, in overhead cam engines, there are some arrangements where the valves are all in a row and these valves are right. Wow, that didn't feel good. Um, the valves are pushed on directly by the cam. Um, in this one, uh, to make it flow the way the engineers wanted to, the valves are offset 
So it's intaking on this side, exhausting on this side. They lean the valves that way. And we're using rocker arms. So we have a rocker arm. This pad runs, <coughs> thanks Cole. This pad runs on the camshaft and this, there again we have an adjustment there on the tip of the rocker that pushes on the valve. So we've put the camshaft on top of the head and we've reduced the moving parts in that part of the valve train some is we don't have a lifter and we don't have a push rod but we do still have a rocker arm. Um, there are also some designs that have the valves offset like this but there will be an intake cam on top of the intake valves and a second exhaust cam over here on top of the exhaust valves and uh, you'll hear that advertised as a dual overhead cam engine. Well, sounds good in advertising, right? Um, but there again, I'm not convinced that it's a great thing because we've gone and increased the number of moving parts again. But most of the engines that are doing that um, are actually variable valve timing engines. So what they, the reason they're doing that, they've got some overly complicated highly sophisticated, prone to failure sprockets on the front of their camshaft that are controlled by the computer and they can change the timing of the exhaust camshaft separate from when they change the timing of the intake camshaft. Um, so that can be managed for performance reasons or it can be managed for um, emission control reasons or some of both. And in most modern engines that have dual overhead cams, they're doing a combination of both. Some of the way they're managing the valve timing is for performance reasons, and some of it is for emissions reasons. Um, since Cole brought us these, let's see here, I think we need a 12 millimeter. So you can see in this head, there's three uh, cam bearing journals so there's actually pressurized engine oil coming up into the head through these um, the pressurized engine oil actually comes up into the head through this port right here um, and then there's ports drilled through the head so that it gets up into these cam journals through this hole right here. And that lubricates the camshaft supports. And you'll notice the thrust as far as not letting it move front and back are these shoulders manufactured on this shaft. And that's a common way for it to be done in overhead valve engines. Excuse me, overhead cam engines, which are also overhead valve. So. There's our There's our camshaft in it and then this is our rocker assembly and that's backwards And on this particular engine what holds the rocker assemblies on is the head bolts. So there's a long bolt that goes through this rocker pedestal, clear through the head and into the block. Um, some engines will do that. A lot of them will have separate fasteners. But you can see this camshaft, this rocker, runs off of this cam lobe and comes over here and pushes on this valve. But there again, we've... We've eliminated the push rod and the lifter. And some of these engines that run that camshaft right over the top of the valve, all they will have is a little bucket that holds a shim, and you can change the shim for different thicknesses of shim to adjust them. But they, uh, they in some cases, reduce the number of moving parts even more when that cam is directly over the valve. But 
The trade-off is that camshaft is so far from the crankshaft that we have, well, in this particular engine, we have this uh, We have this timing chain that's this long. The less, the less moving parts in your, in your uh, cam timing, the better. But this isn't too bad. I meant to bring tonight, but somehow I failed to get here with them. Wanted to show that as far as driving the camshaft, there's also three common systems. We looked at that engine out there that was gear to gear, so a gear on the crankshaft, a gear on the camshaft, directly driving each other. This is a chain drive. This is a double row chain, um, which there, boy, a lot of engines have been built with chain drive, and the vast majority of those are a single row chain. But if you notice, there again, our crankshaft sprocket has half as many teeth as our camshaft sprocket, so that we can run our camshaft half the speed of our crank to get our valve timing like we want it. Um, this particular cam sprocket is made adjustable so we can loosen these and move all that so we can precisely dial in the timing of our camshaft to our crankshaft. That's not typically done in factory engines, um, but this engine, we're building it with a little bit of a performance camshaft and wanted to be able to precisely time it, so we've bought this aftermarket adjustable cam sprocket. The factory one had no adjustment in it. Um, the third common system of driving our camshaft is a belt. Um, and I had some belts that I meant to bring this evening and somehow I didn't get them in the pickup. But they're typically a flat belt about that width and they have cogs or teeth, I guess they would be a toothed belt and instead of a sprocket, they have what's called cogs, which is more or less a sprocket, but with notches that are made to match the profile of the inside of the belt. And that same deal, the, the cog for the camshaft will be twice the size of the crankshaft one, so it runs at half, this, half the speed. On chains like this, you can imagine running this at high speed, there's a lot of whip here in this chain. So on timing chain setups that get very long, there will always be guides that usually some kind of a plastic material that runs against this surface and this surface. And a lot of times there will be a tensioner, some kind of either a spring or this particular engine has a little cylinder there that runs oil pressure in it that pushes here to keep the slack out of the chain. Because you can imagine any little bit of wear to the sprocket or any little bit of wear to the rollers in the chain well, you get some slack. And actually, in a brand new one, there's a little bit of slack. So there'll be a tensioner on the one side. Um, belts, same deal. You'll have a tensioner for the belt. Because um, as belts stretch and wear, um, you'll need to take up the slack. Um, if you're ever looking at one of these belt or chain drive systems with a tensioner, and you're wondering which way the engine turns, um, it'll always turn the direction where the slack is in the side where the tensioner is. So if the tensioner's on this side, you know that the crankshaft is turning this way. So it will be pulling hard on the side of the chain or the belt that's not where the tensioner is. And likewise, that side will almost always be straight. So it'll have a straight guide. And a lot of times the, sli the side where the slack is will have a curved guide with a a tensioner pushing against it. Um, there are getting to be fewer and fewer of these, but there are some engines that that tensioner um, only works when the engine's running. And if you try and turn the engine backwards, um, you can actually make this skip and you'll get the camshaft out of time and things go real south real fast. Um, so there's pros and cons to all those systems. Um, as far as camshaft drive systems, if you're running a chain or you're running gears like that, they need to be lubricated. Um, the belts 
There's a rare exception to this, but most all the belt systems are dry. So you'll actually, on your camshaft and on your crankshaft, you'll have a seal, and then you'll have your cog that your belt runs on. So the belt will run in a, in a dry atmosphere most often. I only know of one engine that's an exception to that. I know of one Dutz diesel engine that runs a wet belt, but every other belt drive engine I'm aware of, the belt is run dry. Um, the belt is much lighter, so you have less mass spinning than if you have a chain. And so there's, there's a vast majority of the modern overhead cam engines, when the cam is on top of the head, that will be belt drive. So what happens if that belt dries out and cracks and breaks? Yeah, yeah. Because then your camshaft stops spinning and your valve stop moving. But what happens to the crankshaft? It keeps spinning for several seconds. Well, when you're, say your engine's turning a thousand revolutions per minute and it takes a fourth of a minute for that crank to stop spinning, well, that piston probably hit that valve 250 times, right? Now, there are um, some engines that there, again, we talked about are non-interference engines. They're typically, um, every one that I know of is going to be a gasoline engine that's two valves per cylinder. Because when you get compression ratios high, like you do in the diesels, there's not room enough for the valve to open with the piston up. And there again, you get into four valve per cylinder engines, there's not enough room for all that to happen. So... But there's actually charts that um, guys that deal with timing belts a lot will have a chart, and they can look up this year, make and model of engine, and it'll tell them whether it's an interference engine or not. So if you call them and you've got a broken timing belt, they can look on their chart and know whether to tell you, okay, we can put a belt on it, or whether they tell you, you need an engine. Because nine times out of ten, if... If the piston hits the valve, it's going to bend the valve over sideways and damage the head. And in many cases, broken pieces are going to circulate between the piston and the block. And you've pretty much trashed it all. Um, there are some rare cases where, okay, all it did was bend the valve and you can take the head off and have the machine shop fit some new valves to it and put it back together, but you don't get that lucky very often. Mm -hmm. You lucked out. That one is a non-interference in you. It, yeah, and every vehicle that runs that will have in the owner's manual what the maintenance interval on that belt is. And usually they're fairly conservative on those. Um, I'm aware of one engine that the factory recommended interval is 75,000. And I can tell you from experience... I worked at a dealership that saw a lot of those vehicles, and at about 90,000, they would break. So they were a little bit on the conservative side, but there again, you don't want to wait till it breaks to change it. Um, and you're right, timing belt replacement is is not necessarily a cheap labor thing, because a lot of times there's quite a bit of stuff that has to come apart to get everything out of the road to get at that belt. Um, very few engines that run timing chains will have a recommended service interval. Um, more often than not, when that timing chain gets changed is when the engine's not running right and it goes, you know, in your shop or somebody else's shop for a, um, a tune-up because it's not running right. And in the process of trying to get everything tuned up and running right, they figure out that, well, the valves are all opening too late, or 
something like that. And uh, there was a time, like you were talking about, especially in Chevrolet V8 engines, gosh, the first 20 years Chevrolet made V8 engines, they had a metal, it was actually an aluminum sprocket, but the outside edge of it was a product that General Motors called phenolic. It was their special breed of a special kind of plastic. And those teeth would wear thin and then just break off. And when they broke off, of a, and they, it was on the camshaft sprocket, the crankshaft sprocket, um, the smaller one, uh, on those engines was typically steel. But the camshaft sprocket was an aluminum center with plastic teeth on it. And when they shelled out, you were just long side of the road. Um, and it depended on... It depended on the engine, because some of the lower performance ones, if you were going slow enough, um, you might luck out and you might just need a timing chain and timing sprockets. Um, but the ones that were a little higher compression and higher performance, and, and there again, if you were going a little higher RPM when it happened, uh, it was pretty common to just wad all the valves and bust the heads and just trash things. So it probably would have been wise to have had a service interval for those, but I'm not sure the factory cared because it was after they were out of warranty. So I'm not sure, but maybe they thought it was a good idea if it did break and trash your engine, you'd just go buy a new car from them. They didn't, they didn't have to put the bill to fix it because it was... Typically, you know, in the in the V8 Chevrolets that had those plastic gears, those would tend to last at least 75 to 100,000 miles in most cases. And most of those vehicles were sold with 36,000 mile warranties, so it was long after it was their responsibility. Um, and I hate to say that, but sometimes it almost appears that vehicle manufacturers have a strategy to try and crowd you into buying a new car. Um, don't know that for a fact, but it sure seems like it. Um, sure, sure. Everything on the internet's true gospel, right? Um, I don't know. I would say that the life of the diesel pickup engines is dramatically less than it used to be. Um, but there again, well, like we were talking about a minute ago with those O3 engines, that the injectors failed often enough. Well, one of the ways those injectors fail is they stick open. If they stick open and you don't realize what's going on and turn the key off now, you wind up with you know, a piston that looks like one of these. And to pass federal emission standards, they've all had to go to some pretty sophisticated fuel injection systems. Those sophisticated fuel injection systems are pretty finicky about contamination. Um, water even more so than dirt. Because honestly, dirt's not hard to filter out. Um, the water tends to be more of a problem. And, okay, they're also trying to control the tailpipe emissions using exhaust gas recirculation, which is um, a system that takes exhaust that we've started heading down the tailpipe, and we cool it off just a little bit and stuff it back in the engine's throat. Well... Stuff in that black sooty exhaust back in the engine's throat sure can't help the life of the engine. So between the, the overly sophisticated fuel injection systems that are finicky, and if they fail and you don't realize they fail, you can wipe out an engine. And the exhaust gas recirculation that's stuffing trash back in the engine, it's definitely decreased the life expectancy of the diesel engines. Um, long story short, there was 
there was a big difference in what was required in all the all the diesel engines starting January 1 of 03. There was another requirement change January 1 of 07 and another one January 1 of 2010. There was another one in 13, another one in 17. And each one of those steps did clean up the tailpipe, but it also decreased engine life and decreased reliability. Um, I kind of am frustrated when a truck, we tow it into the shop because electronics and emission systems were the failure, and it wasn't actually the base engine that was a failure, but I guess it shouldn't be. It makes me a lot of money. But that's kind of the deal in all those diesel pickups made in the last 10 years. Rarely do we tow one in that it's not because of fuel injection system, the computers that control the fuel injection system, or the emissions equipment is why it's parked alongside of the road instead of going down the road. And all of those things can can take a take a nice engine and trash it in a matter of a couple hundred yards too. Um, for example, this piston right here is out of a 2007 Dodge diesel pickup that a fella called me and described to me what it was doing. And from his description, I was fairly sure he had an injector stuck open. And he said, I'm seven miles from home. Is it seven or nine? I think it might have been nine, the more I think about it. You think I'm safe to drive it home? And I said, no, I can still hear it knocking in the background. Why have you not shut it off? Well, he explained all the reasons it would be a hassle for him to have to call for a ride and get another pickup to haul this trailer home. And I said, well, why'd you call me? If I tell you no, shut it off, and you're not willing to do it, what was the point of calling me in the first place? He drove it nine miles with an injector that was stuck open, and it burned hole clear through the piston. Um, this one was a similar situation. Um, this one went about 25 miles, but the injector was not stuck all the way open. It was stuck probably a fourth of the way open. So, here, I'll hand these to you. You can look at them just for fun. But um, there again, because of the different characteristics, okay, in a gasoline engine, if an injector sticks open, it's going to just flood the engine out. It won't run. And if it does run, it'll barely run well enough to get it to the side of the road. And so when that injector sticks open and fails, why typically it gets towed in and the problem found and fixed before there's catastrophic engine failure. In the diesel engines that are compression ignited, as we talked about that, right, where the compression, 18 to 1, we're bringing that cylinder, pre or the pressure is concentrating our heat energy and bringing that cylinder temperature up to around 1,000 degrees, and then we're injecting the fuel that it ignites as it comes out of the injector. Well, what happens if there's fuel on top of that piston when it's at the bottom? What happens at that, as that piston comes up? Exactly. When you're, typically, when your piston's about two-thirds of the way up its compression stroke, there's enough heat and pressure to ignite that fuel. And you have combustion on top of that piston while the piston's still being forced up by the rotational energy of the rest of the engine. Well, that's what creates that kind of chaos is combustion on top of that piston while it's still traveling up. And see, in the case of some of those, you'll there wasn't enough oxygen in there to complete all that combustion before it started traveling down, and so it's still burning um, way, way before and way after when it should be, and 
okay, we've got 10 times the amount of fuel in that one cylinder that it should have, and it just melts the tops out of the pistons from excessive heat. Yeah, um, it depends. In some cases, I mean, it'll trash the surface of the block. Um, if I remember right, that one, we bored it one millimeter over, and it cleaned up, and we put oversized pistons in it. And um, That one, it actually cracked that cylinder. It cracked the cylinder wall in four places. Blocks scrap iron. There's nothing you can do with that. Um because the, the, the repair sleeves for that engine are designed to restore the surface, but they depend on having a complete cylinder around them to help contain the pressure. Well, when that cylinder around them has four cracks in it, it's not going to contain that pressure, and so it's considered a discard block, which gets expensive. So... Um, So our cylinder heads, wanted to cover a couple of things. Uh, like we've talked about, they'll have intake and exhaust valves. Now because they're the top on our combustion chamber where we're having all this combustion, there's a lot of heat there. So we're also going to have water passages flowing through them. And some of you have looked at that block, but I, I tried to paint all the water passages green in it. And you can see how that water is designed to circulate over the top of each one of those combustion chambers. And like we talked about, we'll have oil flowing up through them to lubricate these parts on top. So we got a lot going on in that cylinder head. Um, one other thing I wanted to talk about just a little bit is like we had talked about a little bit in the hall, the valve timing. So let's talk about our four strokes. So on our intake stroke, our piston's going down, our intake valve is open. That's what's happening the majority of that stroke. Um, but depending on how many RPMs the engine's designed to run and some of the pressures and whatnot, the exact timing of when that valve opens and when it closes, the engineers change that quite a bit. But 99% um, of all our automotive engines, that valve's actually gonna, gonna open just before our piston got to the top. Um, so it's gonna be coming open just barely before this piston tops out and it's going to be open for almost the entire downstroke. Um, we're going to close it right as the piston hits bottom. We're actually going to open it just barely before the intake stroke starts. So we can talk about that overlap again at the other end of this. Um, our compression stroke, of course they're both closed because we want to seal the combustion chamber and compress it, right? Can't compress it if we've got an opening. Our power stroke, we want them both closed because we want all of the pressure that we're creating with that combustion to be used to push the piston down. We don't want to vent any of it anywhere. Now, um, there, you'll see our compression rings do have a gap in the end of them. Now when we're in the cylinder, this ring will be compressed and that gap will be 20 thousandths of an inch or less. In a lot of engines it'll run five to eight thousandths of an inch, but we will get just a little bit of our combustion gases making it past that gap in the ring. Um, and one of the overheads I had for tonight that we couldn't get up, was talking about ring gap spacing. Um, every engine, if you look in the service manual for it, it'll tell you when you're assembling it how they want the gaps in these rings spaced. So this particular engine, they want the top ring on the minor thrust side. They want the second compression ring straight across from it. 
and then they want the gap in the oil control ring back over here. So the idea is the little bit that's getting past the rings, it'll get past the first ring over here, but it's got to travel all the way around the piston to get past the gap in the second ring on the opposite side. And that helps to minimize blow-by. So blow-by is a term that talks about how much of that com combustion gas gets escapes past the piston. Um, and that's going to be more in a worn engine than it will be in a fresh engine. Um, and that, that blow-by winds up in our crankcase, and so we've got to have a way to vent that. Various engines will vent it different ways. Um, you've even, I'm sure, heard of positive crankcase ventilation, PCV. That's a system that instead of just venting it and letting it out as it wants to go, we actually try and suck it out. We hook a vacuum hose to the crankcase and kind of control it a little bit, but actually put the crankcase under a little bit of vacuum so that that, because the, the combustion gases, you, they are acidic and you get too much of that combining with your oil, you've got some acid that can be hard on our bearings and stuff. So we want to kind of get that blow-by out. But anyways, other than the blow-by, we're trying to, and even, even with the rings, we're trying to seal that as much as possible, so we want both our valves closed. So then on our, our exhaust stroke, we're, we're, our piston's traveling upwards, and we've got our exhaust valve open. Um, depending on the engine, but the vast majority of engines, are, the way their camshafts are designed, this exhaust valve is going to open just barely after we hit bottom dead center. Um, so, and it will be open for the entire stroke, and it, it actually will still be fairly open. It's going to be on its way shut, but it won't be all the way shut at the end of this stroke. So there again, as we repeat this, we do another intake. So when we're at top dead center, so this is another term I don't guess I've talked about before, but on our piston travel, when our piston is, is clear at the top and our crankshaft rotation is directly under it, we're going to call that top dead center. When our piston is all the way at the bottom of its travel and the crankshaft is bottomed out straight below it, we're going to call that bottom dead center. So you'll see the abbreviations TDC, top dead center, and BDC, bottom dead center. Um, but so on our exhaust stroke, just before. So I'm trying to think how's the best way to illustrate this. I guess I drew the intake on that side, didn't I? But what we're talking about with valve overlap is so on our exhaust stroke, our piston's going up exhausting. Just before it gets all the way to the top, we're going to start opening that intake valve. And we're going to leave this exhaust valve open as long as we can. So we're going to be working on closing it, but it's not going to be all the way closed at the end of this exhaust stroke. So right here between our exhaust and intake strokes, when that piston hits top dead center, both valves are going to be barely open. The exhaust valve is on its way shut, but it's not all the way shut. And the exhaust, or excuse me, the intake valve has started to open. So you hear the term valve overlap, that's what we're talking about. And that will happen at this top dead center that's in between these two. So there again, between exhaust and intake, we've got our piston at top dead center. So what are we going to have it at the end of the power stroke, right between it and the exhaust stroke? Where's our piston going to be? Bottom. So you'll have a spot here where it's at bottom dead center. And just after bottom dead center, or in some cases right at it, but typically just barely after it, 
um, we're going to open that exhaust valve. So over here, but I didn't write compression, but compression. Between our compression and our power stroke, our piston's going to hit the top. We're going to be at top dead center. Now when we get to the ignition, um, the week we're talking about ignition, you'll hear that we talk about ignition in relation to top dead center. Because when we ignite our combustion, um, depending on what RPMs we're turning, which fuel we're using, and how fast it combusts, um, some other factors like how much compression we're using, how much oxygen we've got in there to work with, when we want to start our combustion. Um, so there'll be, and okay, there are going to be a lot of gasoline engines. We're going to spark that somewhere around eight degrees before. This is a very generic number, and every engine design is going to have its own specific number. And if you're trying to set the adjustments or the tune-up specs on an engine, you'll want to get a get a spec for that specific engine. Um, one nice thing about the internet, you can find a lot of that on the internet. The one thing you got to watch out for is you don't actually know have to know biscuits from anything to type dumb crap into the internet. So when you're reading information off the internet, look at the source and ask yourself, is this coming from a source that's trustworthy? Um, there's a lot of great information on the internet. There's some BS on the internet too. So look at the source before you um, invest your equipment in information you got off the internet. We used to all buy books. And, well, same deal. Uh, most of the books, especially if you bought the book from the engine manufacturer, you got really good data. Aftermarket books, like um, popular ones were Haynes and Chilton's manuals. Mm, not as reliable. Um, so consider the source is all I'm saying there. But anyways, um, you know, a lot of gasoline engines that we are using in automotive applications these days, we're going to hit that spark plug and initiate the burn of our fuel somewhere around eight degrees before top dead center. Um, on our diesel engines, um, and on both gas and diesel engines, most all modern engines are going to vary this depending on load and RPM. So as the RPM changes, the, the ignition system is going to change when it sparks it or when it injects the fuel, but these are base tune-up numbers that are typically at idle with a lot of the adjustment stuff disconnected. This is going to be what's considered a base number. Um, a lot of our diesel engines, how do we start the burn on a diesel engine? We don't have a spark plug. How do we start the burn on our diesel engine? Compression's what ignites it, but how do we get it to that ignition source? We inject the fuel into the cylinder. So we've already compressed that and made it where it will combust, but we're starting that combustion as, it, as the fuel comes out of that fuel injector nozzle. Because the conditions in the cylinder are already right for it to burn. So we will have what we call um, beginning of fuel pulse. So when we start the forcing the fuel in that injector nozzle into the cylinder, right around 14 degrees before top dead center. Now, you talk about, okay, our piston's still traveling up at that point, right? This combustion process takes time. We're running these engines, okay, at idle, we're running them at, say, 800 RPMs. 
That means that that piston's coming up 800 times in a minute. Um, when we're going down the road, it's not uncommon to run them at 2,500 RPMs. So that piston's coming up 2,500 times in a minute. Um, it's hard to think about, in some cases, things that are happening that fast, but because we're talking milliseconds, but it actually takes a little bit of time for this combustion process to happen. And we want it to happen, you know, and start building a lot of pressure right after we're at top dead center. So we need to start the process just a little bit before we want it to actually have the big bang. Does that make sense? Okay, the glow plugs and the intake preheater you talked about do absolutely nothing once the engine's running. But what they're doing is helping to get us some heat in that engine when it hasn't been running because we're, we're igniting that fuel with, with heat we're concentrating, right? So we're taking the heat in the air and concentrating it. Well, when that engine's idling, we're running at seven, 800 RPMs. When we're cranking it with our starter motor, we're typically cranking it at 150 RPMs. Um, so we're taking and con condensing that heat energy much slower. And when we're starting with air that is 30 degrees, there's not as much heat energy to work with. Those two things combined, we need a little bit of help. So that's what the glow plug or the intake air preheater does. It gives us a little more heat to work with in that process to get the engine started. Um, now, having said that, what I said earlier isn't 100% true because most of those management systems are going to continue to cycle the glow plug on and off and make some heat or continue to cycle that intake preheater grid on and off until the water temperature comes up to whatever the computer programmers have determined, which in many cases is somewhere around 60 degrees. So when the antifreeze in the block gets to 60 degrees, they'll shut them systems completely off. And until then, they'll leave the glow plug timer cycle those glow plugs on and off a little bit, or the intake preheater grid cycle on and off a little bit to keep adding a little heat to kind of get things warmed up and going. Um, that's, that's also part of why cranking speed on a diesel engine is really important. Um, there's a lot of those engines that'll start like a champ at 150 RPMs, which is normal cranking speed for most of those. You got a little bit of weak batteries or a partially worn out starter or some cables that are corroded and not getting full battery voltage down to your starter, and it's only cranking at 120 RPMs. Tough to hear that by ear. Makes a dramatic difference in how well it starts. Um, the engine I'm thinking of right off is the 7.3 liter power stroke. It will start like a champ at 150 RPMs. It'll barely start at 120 RPM. Um, so there, in that little bit of difference, there's a lot of difference in the heat concentration that's happening during that compression stroke. So, um, for anybody that may not know what what we were just talking about, um, in in a lot of diesel engines, there will be um, a ceramic type element on a on a device sort of similar to spark plug, but it's not designed to make a spark. You put voltage to it, and it just glows red hot. And they'll stick the tip of that down through the head so that um, when we're trying to start a diesel engine, it will add some heat right there in the combustion chamber where we're, we need more heat. Um, this particular diesel engine does it a little differently in the, in the flow of air coming in this intake. There's a heater grid. It looks a lot like the heater grid. Have you ever looked down in your toaster at home, Joe, where you make toast? When you've got it running, 
Is there some things in there that glow? Some little squiggly heat elements? Doing the same thing here. They're, they've got some of them little squiggly heat elements. They hit them with electricity and make them glow so that it adds some heat energy to the air coming in the engine that we're compressing to make this whole deal start. Yes. Ford and Chevy both run glow plugs. Dodge is, uh, has always run an intake preheater grid. None other than paying me. Um, I'm being a little bit of a smart aleck, but it's actually true. So unless we get into really old stuff, I'm going to say pre-19... 92 um, vehicles the control systems in those um, you turn the key on once your wait to start light comes on when it goes out is when the calculations they think there's enough heat there that it should start it will continue to cycle those on and off as much as they think that w the, the glow plug will tolerate without burning up until that water temperature gets up to the 60 degrees. When you turn the key off and turn it back on, you restarted that whole thing. You probably are putting more heat to the glow plug than it really can tolerate. You're probably going to burn them out, and then you're going to pay to replace them. Um, if you want more heat in that cylinder, because it's especially cold, just wait a few seconds after the wait start light goes out. Is there again, the control system is continuing to keep them on as much as it thinks it can without burning them up. So, for example, that same 7.3 power stroke we were talking about, if when the wait start light goes out, wait 5 or 10 seconds before you hit the starter, you'll have more heat in there, but you haven't restarted all those calculations about how much the glow plug will take. Now, having said that, a lot of guys will restart it, and they'll, but they're doing the same thing. They're just waiting longer with the glow plug energized before they hit the starter. But you've restarted that whole cycle of the calculations, the timer mechanism or the timer in the computer is doing. And so you're running a lot greater chance of overheating the glow plug and burning it out. Um, but it, it, uh, it actually is very effective to let them run just a little bit longer. But you'll actually have less failures of the glow plug if you won't restart it. Just after the light goes out, wait 10 seconds before you hit the starter. Same deal. Um, and the, the grids in most years of Cummins, there's two grids. There's an upper and a lower. And the management computer management system looks at air temperature and water temperature and determines whether it turns one on or both of them on and how long it leaves them on and in some cases it'll fire one and then turn it off and then do the other one so that it's not overheating one of them and burning it out and I will say that we have a very low failure rate of the preheater grids the whole time I've been working on diesel engines, I bet I've replaced less than half a dozen of them. Um, glow plugs are a high failure rate item. We replace a couple of sets of those every week at least. Um, the other thing is the both of those, to make heat, they flow quite a bit of amps of electricity. So um, the switches that power them up can be failure items. And the, those are switched with a relay. Um, a, a relay is a device that will have a low, low voltage control system, which we can connect to a computer, and it controls high flow contacts. Well, those high flow contacts, every time you open them, there's a little bit of a spark. Well, you spark that a million times, and the whole thing's going to be arced up and burned up. So on both the glow plug system and the intake preheater system, we do replace those relays fairly often. But there again, we replace them way more often on the glow plug systems than we do on the intake preheater systems. And I 
I don't know why, because they both flow the relatively close to the same amps. They both actually flow about the same amount of electricity as the starter on a gasoline engine does. They're both flowing somewhere around 120 amps, give or take. Um, so they're a, they're a high consumption item. On that subject, um, it still surprises me, but we get this phone call every week. I started my pickup and the voltmeter's going up and down and up and down. And then once the pickup warms up a little bit, it quits doing it. Voltmeter's going up and down and up and down because the control system is turning the glow plugs on and off and on and off until the water temperature gets up to 60 degrees. And it's not a malfunction the way they're designed to work. Um... Well, fellas, I'm sorry, I ran late again. And um, I think I think we're actually kind of caught up with what we were supposed to cover for this week. So that's one good thing. Mm -hmm. The opinion is we've got that, that whole combustion process advanced too much before we get the piston in a position to go down. Because, of course, when we've got the crankshaft directly under the piston, it's locked in place. And we need that crankshaft um, pin to be slightly past center so that the, it can be pushed down when the main surge of combustion happens. Um, that if that main surge of combustion happens while we're still right at top dead center and have things locked up, it makes a pretty obnoxious noise. Um, and, uh, you know, if you do too much of that, you can tear things up. But that's, that's what the ping is, is the combustion process has, has advanced too much before we get over top dead center. But if we wait too late, and that main combustion doesn't happen until we're way past top dead center, then we've lost a lot of the power we were trying to make. It's been wasted because it happened too late. So it's a balance. And there again, the, the time it takes for that combustion to happen is relatively fixed, but the time we have for it to work in our, our machine changes quite a bit between 800 rpms and 3000 rpms so that that engine that our base timing at 800 rpms we've set at eight degrees before top dead center when we're running at 3000 degrees before top or excuse me when we're running at 3000 rpms that spark may hit at 30 degrees before top dead center because it's taking less time for the crankshaft to turn at that RPM, but we still need that amount of time from when we hit the spark until we've got that combustion that far advanced to start pushing the piston down. Right. So on engines, say, I don't know, made from probably in the 50s through the mid-80s, where that spark timing was all tried to be varied mechanically, um, there were two common advance systems. And one of them was a mechanical advance where we had some weights. And the faster you spun that shaft, the more the weights tried to swing out. And they worked on a little arm, and so the more they slung out, the more they would advance the cam that was in the distributor, not the valve cam, and change the timing. Um, so that was known as mechanical or centrifugal advance. Then there was also, um, in some cases, just a lever going to a vacuum pot, and they would use some vacuum to 
move that lever and rotate the the point base or the the pickup base in the distributor to change that timing. Um, s- starting start started phasing in in the mid 80s, and by the mid 90s, all gasoline automotive engines that timing advance was calculated in the computer, and there were there was no and I guess kind of in the middle there is where we came up with what was called electronic ignition. So there would be a small computer, and it was connected just to the distributor, and it might be connected to an RPM sensor. Um, a lot of the later ones were, and that computer was just for calculating when we want the spark to happen. And of course, it would trigger the coil. Um, but like I said, it kind of phased in, but by the mid-90s, that function was done in the main engine control computer that also can calculated fuel timing and fuel volumes and the spark timing all together in, in one box. And prior to that, well, we were running, okay, in the 30s and 40s, why typically they were running gas engines that ran 6 to 1 compression. And wide open throttle was like 1,600 RPMs. And it was fixed. They didn't really vary the timing much. Um, but there again, that was a big thing to add performance to an engine was to be able to vary that spark timing. Um, so when they started doing some of the mechanical and vacuum advanced distributors, um, it made it possible to run more compression and boy, the the power of a similar sized engine came up quite a bit. That was about the same time they, you know, add more power because we could vary that, that spark timing. Um, we could run more compression. Well, we got to put more bearings on the crank. So that's when you saw crankshafts, instead of having a main bearing every other cylinder, they had one in between every cylinder. Um, any other questions? Or I was just going to pass out the quiz. Yep, thank you, Cole. And...